Hey guys, happy Thursday. And what makes it even more special is it's a Thursday in August, which means tomorrow, everybody want to join with me? True to our tradition, there will be, thank you, Matt, no briefing. Uh, what was that? There will be a briefing. <laughs> no briefing. Anyway, welcome to the State Department. I think we have some interns in the back. Welcome. Uh, good to see you in this uh, exercise and transparency and democracy. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was, a, I I thought it was an exercise, of, an exercise of, in spin and obfuscation. <laughs> All right. Can you tell this is my last briefing before vacation? Anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, let's start. Uh, so just uh, at the top, I did want to briefly mention this U.S. Secretary of State was in Argentina today. Uh, he did meet with uh, Argentine President uh, Macri. Uh, they also, he also met, rather, with a local American Chamber of Commerce and will, of course, always, as always, meet with uh, personnel and families from the U.S. Embassy there. Uh, he did meet with the foreign minister uh, earlier today. They launched the high-level dialogue to strengthen a bilateral partnership that is uh, uh, rooted in uh, common values, principles, and interests. And as part of the dialogue, uh, Secretary Kerry also met with Foreign Minister Malcora, as well as the Argentine Ministers of Production and Energy. Uh, they discussed uh, economic reform priorities, trade and investment energy, or rather trade and investment, energy, and bilateral cooperation in support of Argentina's uh, reintegration into the international financial community and sustainable economic growth in both our countries. Uh, I'll leave it there, and over to you, Matt. Um, okay, just very briefly, um, do you have anything more you can say about this American woman who was killed in the attack in London? Uh, not a whole lot more. Uh, you saw the Secretary uh, passed on our deepest condolences to the uh, victims and families of those who were killed or injured in last night's attack. Uh, as you know, we did confirm the death of a U.S. citizen, uh, and uh, there are reports, of course, uh, many of you have reported that there's another U.S. citizen who was injured in that attack. Uh, we, as always, stand ready uh, to provide all possible consular assistance uh, to the families of the victims. Uh, I can't, because of privacy considerations, share any additional information at this time. So, have the Brits given you any indication of more than what they have said in public about what, what was behind it? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, there, obviously, the investigation continues, and they've spoken to uh, at least their initial okay. uh, uh, findings. All right. Uh, yep. And then uh, also, while he was in, um, or still is in, in uh, BA, uh, the Secretary was asked about the Iran was. The, the, the transfer and basically repeated what you guys in the White House said um, yesterday right. about it not being a ransom. But so in keeping with your uh, opening statement pledge to be that this is an exercise in transparency <laughs> and democracy, can you, do you have a better idea about why you can't get in, discuss the details of how this $400 million uh, was sent? Sure. Um, uh, so, um, I, I did ask this question, uh, and look, uh, bottom line is that we uh, generally uh, make a practice of not commenting publicly on uh, the details of uh, these kinds of transactions, uh, such as settlement payments. Uh, we don't normally even identify the parties involved, and that's just due to, to the confidential nature of uh, these transactions. But. Well, Wait a and second. I, I yeah. recognize that a lot of uh, a lot of details have been shared. Uh, you guys shared them the back record. in January. Well, we did. You announced that, the entire settlement. It wasn't well, we, as we if did, you we did acknowledge the settlement, quiet. but the details is what I'm saying. The, the how these uh, transactions are carried out. So you're still not prepared today not to prepared confirm. To confirm that. Okay. Well, let me just make the point that that doesn't seem very transparent. And your point is well taken. Um, okay. So. Despite the fact that the administration uh, administration officials, including you, including the secretary, including yeah. your your colleague at the, at the White House, are saying are saying over and over and over again that this wasn't a ransom payment, that question or that uh, case continues to be made by many many people, not just people who are necessarily critics of the Iran deal, but by others as well. Um, and so, do you acknowledge at least the appearance 
of well, and I think I spoke to this ransom. Yes. Sure. Well, I mean, look. I mean, first of all, um, you know, uh, a couple of thoughts on that. One is, I, and I spoke to this yesterday. I thought I did at least. Um, well, you know, the optics. But the thing is, is that it did not put this to rest. And and when you you come out and talk about transparency, but and then you say that you're you expect people to just t take you at your word, which is fair enough, that this wasn't a ransom payment, and yet it persists. So people aren't taking you at your word. Not, not you personally, but no, no, I understand the that, administration Matt. in general. I understand that. I, look, I mean, you know, I, I will acknowledge or I will admit, uh, uh, and I think, uh, you know, that this was, you know, there was, as we've all talked about, uh, whether the White House or the Secretary or myself, you know, that there were several lines of effort ongoing that came, that culminated at the same time. Part of that was because we had these, as I said, this space that was opened up by the negotiations that we had uh, the maneuvering room, if you will, uh, to close out uh, this ongoing uh, settlement dispute. But the idea that this was all orchestrated uh, as part of uh, some kind of quid pro quo is just not accurate. And, and the reason is, is that the, the settlements team, you know, they were toiling in that vineyard separate and apart from the other negotiations that were ongoing for, as I said, years, if not decades before on some of these settlement issues. But, uh, you know, we were and we saw an opportunity to close out this settlement case as part of a, this, as I said, part of the um, um, implementation day agreement or um, reaching implementation day, rather. Uh, and at the same time, we were working uh, the release of these uh, detainees. I recognize, I can see the optics of this and that people would draw assumptions, people do, that we can't keep them from doing so. Um, but it's just not true that well, there's there, any okay. linkage. Well, there's a report that I'm sure you saw last night that the Justice Department had issues with this and said that it would look, yeah. even if it wasn't technically, per se, a ransom, it would give that perception. And it's hard not to see that if it is viewed by the receiving party as a ransom or a quid pro quo, how it isn't. Well, again, we talked about this yesterday, I thought at least, uh, you know, a couple points to make on that. Uh, one is there's always an interagency discussion uh, around any decision like this, uh, and every relevant agency uh, weighs in. Um, and I think I said yesterday that, of course, we were aware of the optics surrounding this and the fact that, you know, people might draw that conclusion. But, uh, you know, it, it was, we felt it was in uh, our national security interest, as well as in the interest of the American taxpayers uh, to save them uh, what could have been billions of dollars uh, had this gone to uh, settlement or adjudication, uh, you know, we felt it was uh, prudent to act and to seize the moment. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, this, these all of these aspects weren't discussed within the interagency process. Uh, and I think the Justice Department has spoken to this uh, as well. But as the, I think the article that you're referring to uh, seemed to allege that somehow we overruled uh, these other agencies and you know, the State I, Department doesn't have that much. <laughs> doesn't have I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to underestimate our, our the weight we pull, but uh, I can assure you that it's a consultative process. And uh, well, in know, the and, consultative and process, I, mean, I realize you probably weren't involved in it. Didn't anyone overrule. say that? Hey, well, we maybe we can't overrule other agencies, and you know, we don't. You know, but it is as okay, I said, that's, it's, that, it's, that, it's that's a good discussion. to know. So, if I want to cover power <laughs> in Washington, what building should I be at? <laughs> I'll talk about that off the, off the record. <laughs> but wait, I just want <laughs> yeah, this will be this will be the last yeah, one. Yeah, sure. The uh, um, I, I just, so in, in in all of the interagency discussion, sure. And knowing that you probably weren't directly involved in that discussion, but from what you know of it, was there anyone out there that said, "Hey, maybe it would be best if we want to avoid this perception, which you knew was going to happen, to wait a little bit on making this delivery." Uh. So uh, I'll leave it at this, is, uh, with, uh, with this, um, that, you know, this decision 
was thoroughly vetted through the interagency process. We looked at all the pros and cons of it, uh, um, and ultimately it was decided that uh, the pros outweighed the cons and that we should uh, take advantage of the fact that we can reach agreement on this now. Now, to go back to your other point, which is that the perception that, or that this is going to be played up by the Iranians as, as you noted, as a ransom, and we've seen comments by uh, some Iranian officials to that in that, uh, in that vein, uh, you know, uh, we, we've tried never to let uh, Iranian rhetoric uh, sway uh, our actions in any way, shape, or form, because we know uh, that oftentimes they're playing to their own domestic constituency. Um, Again, we were clear-eyed as we went into this, but we ultimately felt like it was the right decision to, to act. Uh, uh, was, yeah, there sure. was there a discussion around this um, that if the money wasn't paid or if you didn't do the deal or, or pay up then, that you might never have been able to given a, a domestic political pushback here? Uh, so, uh, you know, look, I think uh, – what was probably of greater concern was the fact that um, our legal teams and legal experts who have been working on this process believe that uh, this could go uh, before the tribunal for decision uh, sooner rather than later. So again, there was uh, some uh, – uh, that was motivation, I think, to, uh, to move quickly uh, on a settlement. Uh, that we felt was in our interest to take. Uh, as for, you know, the domestic political piece, um, you know, we're always we're aware that uh, uh, the, the, and that writ large about, you know, our uh, uh, policies towards Iran, uh, that there are always going to be uh, people within – on the Hill uh, who, as Matt noted, who are going to be against uh, some of this outreach. Um, you will always take that into consideration. And then did um, did this administration, did officials at the State Department brief people on the Hill before that deal was made or, or just afterwards? So were they aware that this was a cash payment um, and were they aware why this was being done at that time? It's a good question, Leslie. Um, so I, I know they were informed about the settlement before. I don't know that they were informed about the mechanics of that settlement, like and, and how it would take place, whether it would, whether it was in cash, et cetera. I don't have that answer in front of me. I apologize. I, don't, you, I haven't been. I don't have the details. I'll try to get more when you said clarity on that. Yeah, that would be good. Um, when you say before, was it just before the um, money was released or uh, before the tribunal met? I mean, when, what, what do you mean by before the time frame? Well, before the settlement was reached, I think is what you know. Before we, uh, before we actually did the transaction uh, on the settlement, okay. so you know. But as to the details of how that transaction took place, uh, I, I just don't have that level of. And then one, one, uh, one more. Clarity. When was the um, 1.3 billion in interest settled? That was done through a uh, through the judgment fund, which is administered by the Treasury. Um, but. When was that 1.3? I was told it was fully settled. Uh, when was that done and how was it done? Sure. Um, so the payment for the compromise that was reached on interest, that was 1.3 billion, as you note. Uh, that was provided out of the judgment fund, and that's the source of funding to pay uh, judgments and settlements of claims against the United States uh, when there is no other source of funding. Um, and uh, I think awards and settlements of tribunal claims have been paid out of that fund in the past. Uh, since 1991, I think, to a tune of some $278 million before, uh, prior to this settlement. Um, your question is when, when – Was it done several weeks after the $400 million in cash was transferred? I know that it was – that it was done. Um, I don't know that I, – I don't have a date – a specific date on when that actually took place. Can you – can you find that out, please? I can try to find that out. I know also that uh, Treasury was speaking to that yesterday. Uh, as well as today. Oh, I didn't see those remarks, which is because it's caused confusion as far as I when they're that. paid, and was that also paid in cash, or, or is it done through the um, a, a transfer mechanism, given that sanctions at that stage were then lifted? Right. Well, some sanctions, not Right. Not Sorry, I'm just looking through here to see if I have an actual date on it. I don't think I do. Mark, yes. You said that uh, some Iranian officials were saying that it was ransom money. They were saying that? 
Yeah, I think Iranian the, I think the, the, the Wall Street Journal article yesterday. That is not their money. I think the Wall Street Journal article yesterday uh, cited one Iranian uh, military official saying it was ransom. But I'm getting. I'm not going to. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, that's what I'm because you said that. I yes. Mean, uh, yeah. If I you look at the uh, if you look at the piece that ran in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, it does quote. Well, I mean, the Iranian was saying it at and, the time right, back yeah, in January I agree. as yeah. well. But just, look, can I just ask you? So of course you said that you know that, that you had, the tribunal might have been coming up with its judgment that could have could have cost the taxpayers billions more in dollars. So what makes you, what gave you the idea that after three decades of litigation, this tribunal was, was going to come to a decision the very week that you also reached the nuclear deal? Oh, I don't know. The no, very I, I week didn't mean that to imply that, the, but I didn't mean to imply that it was going to be that very week. I think that that was so, a, an impetus for acting because right. we thought it would come soon. I don't know. I don't have a After a, a 35 years, it was just going to. Um, well, again, all of these things. I mean, did they? Did someone on the tribute commission tell you? No, but I mean, look, these teams have been working on these issues, and it was going to come up in the near future. And the legal experts or the team that was working on this, uh, their advice was to act while we could for a settlement that would save people money. I don't know that there was. You know, I don't. Uh, okay. I'm not trying to imply After that it was. Years. I'm not trying to imply that it was that next week. Or even that next month, but it was. I think okay. it was, well, it was but considered it that it would be. Go ahead. No, no. Finish. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I get what you're saying, but I'm just saying that then it doesn't it give more. Wouldn't it give make it more of a? Um, wouldn't it have given a less of the bad? Wouldn't it be less bad optics then if it wasn't that imminent? If it wasn't going to be the next day or the next week to wait so that the Iranians couldn't make the argument that it was a that it. That it was a ransom. No. I, I, Again, no. we're back to the optics argument, okay. and uh, you know, I've, I've said what I would say on that. All right. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, one more sure. on the on the optics argument. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so, the U.S. policy against paying ransom, it it seems like it was designed to prevent the feeling by other countries or terrorist organizations that the U.S. government could be blackmailed. Is That's there accurate. any concern that because of the timing of this that other countries or terrorist organizations will see this as a change in U.S. policy, that they could kidnap an American and request ransom and it would be paid. Well, I would hope not. Um, you know, and obviously we've been working hard uh, over the last uh, 24 hours in trying to uh, um, disabuse anyone of that, uh, uh, of that conclusion. Uh, we don't pay ransom and we don't for specifically those reasons. And so, you know, uh, all I can say is that is our policy going forward. It's been our policy, uh, and anyone who acts under the assumption that we do pay ransom would be acting uh, uh, wrongly. So how is uh, the balance likely to be paid in the future, Mark? How is the balance? The balance, of what the balance was paid. I, I, think, paid. I think I just confirmed so, that. So you just confirmed yeah, that. So yeah, out of the no. uh, settlement fund, yeah, or the yeah. judgment fund, excuse me. But what I don't have, and I apologize, I don't have a, a date of when that when that took place. Yeah, Please. Are you take that as a, as a question? I will do my best. Thank you. And uh, Mark, uh, do you know if the secretary would consider uh, going uh, in front of uh, the House committee to testify as uh, he has been asked to? Well, I mean, obviously, we always uh, try to uh, work with Congress uh, to address their concerns. Um, mm -hmm as to who would testify before any kind of hearing. Uh, that's something we'll take under consideration, uh, given the Secretary's busy schedule, busy travel uh, schedule. Uh, um, you know, we would try to work with Congress to find uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, way forward, but uh, I'm not aware that he's been asked. Change of topic? I'm happy to change topics, but let's finish with Iran. If we're done, I'm done with Iran. Okay, go ahead, Barbara. Uh, just Argentina, the, yep. Mr. Kerry said that the declassified documents of, from the dirty war would be, the first tranche would be given, delivered on Thursday. Do you have any information about what will be in that, that, um, those documents? Will they be specific, will they reference specific cases of the disappeared or will they give their families so, answers to sure. questions? Sure. Um, so my understanding of that uh, is that it will additional, it will be a declassification of additional U.S. government records. Uh, that are related to human rights abuses by the Argentine military dictatorship. Uh, and uh, 
in fact, that he delivered a first tranche of these declassified documents uh, uh, to President uh, Macri. Um, I don't necessarily have, uh, I mean, I, I would characterize them as um, military and intelligence records, but I don't have, I don't know if they, you know, speak about specific cases, I would assume that there are some uh, details in there that speak to specific cases, but I don't have any more details for you. Any more transcripts of calls between Kissinger and the general communications? I, I, I don't know what the contents were. Um, however, they, the documents will be posted on the Director of National Intelligence website uh, and available to the public on August 8th. So there you go. Just follow up on that just quick. Are these documents the same documents that the President said were going to be released That's right. when he was there? Uh, I believe so, yes. So, in keeping with, yeah, President Obama's commitment, yes, so, that he made to President Macri. And, and, and do we do you know any more, like, uh, how, how many there are? Were they transported down there on pallets? Or <laughs> were there fewer than, could you bring them in briefcases or something like that? Uh, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a sense of, of the scale or the scope of the delivery of documents. Uh, I'll try to get that for you. And that, he, he gave some to the President today and a second tranche on Thursday, is that correct? No, oh, today's Thursday. So yes, I, I, my understanding was just a tranche that was delivered today. Tranche, okay. Yeah. Please. Uh, Turkey? Uh, of course. Turkish media reporting the secretary will go to Turkey later this month. Is that true? Uh, nothing to announce in that regard. Um, uh, related to that? Yep. Uh, could you tell us exactly where the U.S. is um, in the issue of the extradition process of Mr. Gulen, as, uh, as you may have seen? Uh, a Turkish court has issued what they call an international uh, warrant against Mr. Gulen. Do, do, do you see this as the formal, formal, sorry, uh, extradition uh, uh, request? Um, uh, so, my understanding of where we are with the extradition request is that you know we've been, uh, or that the Turkish authorities have delivered, uh, I think, made several deliveries of documents. Uh, to, uh, to us, um, and that we're in the process of uh, going through those documents. Um, as you know, we don't, and we've said this previously, we don't speak uh, publicly about uh, the details of uh, the extradition request process. Uh, it's not something that is uh, necessarily an overnight process. Uh, it takes time uh, to evaluate the evidence that's presented. I think at this point, uh, my understanding at least, having talked to my colleagues at the Department of Justice, is that they're still uh, trying to make a determination of whether uh, the documents that were delivered to them do constitute what they believe is a formal extradition request. Uh, and I realize there's some, uh, you know, the rhetoric coming from Turkey is that they have made a formal request. I think uh, and, and uh, uh, I believe, in fact, that uh, we're still trying to assess that. So your position has not ch changed in, in two weeks. You still don't know if, or you, you, you don't say. You right, we've received, as I said, we've received formal. documents. Uh, we're, we're studying those documents. Um, and uh, we talked about an initial tranche that we, we had, had received from them that did not, we believe, uh, uh, constitute a formal extradition request. Um, but we uh, subsequently re received uh, more documents. Uh, we're looking through them, and I think uh, they're trying to figure out whether this is the full <laughs> uh, request. And I don't think we've, they've reached that determination yet. Please. Uh, the, uh, the second tranche of documents, does that involve evidence related to the coup itself? Because the first one, I think, w was uh, based on investigations from before the coup. Uh, you are correct, I think, in the first thing. Uh, as in terms of the second tranche, uh, uh, I don't know. I think they're still trying to assess whether that's the case. Uh, I don't have a, I don't have a, a specific readout on what whether the, those documents pertain specifically to uh, well, I mean, Mr. Gulen's involvement have they in the, any or evidence alleged to the coup? Yeah, I, I don't know uh, honestly. On, on Turkey, a couple more. Yeah. Uh, it, after three weeks, do you have more of an understanding how the coup happened in Turkey? Whether your own assessment, whether the documents from Turkey, but your on assessment, do you think this Gulen movement or Fethullah Gulen have anything to do with the coup? I mean, uh, it's a fair question. I'm not sure that we would necessarily uh, 
share our assessment. I think that, um, you know, uh, well, a couple things. One is, you know, as we've done from the very beginning, we condemn uh, the failed coup in Turkey. Um, you know, and we also have rejected and continue to reject uh, any attempt to overthrow uh, the democratically elected government uh, in uh, Turkey. Uh, we support that government uh, wholeheartedly as a strong ally and partner in the region. Um, uh, in terms of assessing, you know, who is behind the coup, I know that uh, we all know that Turkish authorities are looking at that uh, very closely, investigating it. Um, you know, that's a matter for them to uh, reach a conclusion about. Um, uh, I don't have any specific conclusions to draw at this point. Uh, while Turkish authorities are investigating this, yep. uh, shut down, Turkish authorities shut down yep. uh, hundreds of uh, media organizations. Uh, about 66,000 6, people are sacked and about 20,000 people are arrested. These numbers can be a little different. Yep. Uh, and President Erdogan today said this is only the tip of the iceberg. They just starting to uh, do you, uh, how, how are you assessing so far Turkish government's uh, action, whether you see them excessive actions as once uh, questioned here? So, um, and we've conveyed this publicly as well as privately in our conversations with our Turkish counterparts. Uh, indeed, as you said, President spoke with uh, President Erdogan shortly after the coup attempt, and Secretary Kerry has spoken with his uh, counterpart, uh, Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu. Uh, several times as well. And uh, we made very clear we understand uh, the need for them to uh, go after the alleged perpetrators of this uh, coup. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we've emphasized the importance of upholding the democratic institutions and uh, the rule of law uh, that exists in Turkey and the importance of that uh, to the Turkish people and to the integrity of Turkey's uh, democracy. But you see those signs that a major approach is underway, maybe a major approach that cuts across all institutions and aspects of Turkish society? I mean, society. you know, I, I think what I'll, uh, I'll leave it at this. I'll, I would say we're watching uh, developments there very closely, and uh, we're making very clear uh, that the Turkish government, um, again, while we understand uh, the basis for its actions, uh, that it also bears in mind uh, that it must uh, hold true to its uh, democratic standards. Well, Are you concerned? Yeah, sorry, oh, Elhan, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say that all, uh, almost everybody in Turkey agrees or thinks that the United States has something to do with the coup. And well, and I, you know, when he asked me about our conclusions, I didn't want to offer that up there, but that's uh, yeah. completely absurd, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, I'm a, we're conscious of the fact that, you know, after an event like this, uh, there's lots of conspiracy theories, uh, lots of allegations tossed about, but the suggestion that the United States was in any way involved in the attempted overthrow of the government, the democratically elected government, of a NATO ally, a major NATO ally, uh, is just absurd. Uh, today, New York Times ran an editorial and uh, it was that there is a question that uh, it's asking what to do with a vital ally that is veering far from democratic norms. This is the one question. And in the same editorial, also it talks about the former State Department official, Andre Barkey. And it says that evidence against Barkey, when the coup erupted in Turkey, he was on the Istanbul island holding a workshop for academics and made some phone calls. My question is whether. Uh, former official under Barkey has anything to do with the coup as far as? Uh, I, I, I have to ask you to contact him directly. He's a former official. I, I don't know that he plays any official role. I have no idea what his involvement may or may not have been. I just don't have any details the on that. first question, the question about the vital ally that veering far from democratic norms, what to do with such ally? Well, again, I, you know, um, you know, I think that you know, there has been concern expressed uh, by many uh, organizations, by many leaders uh, around the world about the scope of uh, 
uh, of uh, the Turkish government's efforts to go after the, uh, the alleged perpetrators of this coup attempt. Um, we're obviously watching it closely. Uh, we've been consulting closely with uh, our Turkish counterparts at every level. And indeed, uh, General Dunford was just there uh, this past week and met with his counterparts. Um, we want to continue, obviously, to cooperate closely with Turkey uh, as a NATO ally and as a major counter Daesh coalition partner. Uh, we don't want to see a disruption to those efforts because, frankly, uh, ISIL Daesh is as much a threat to Turkey as it is to uh, Europe, as it is to the United States, as it is to the region. So we all need to focus on uh, the immediate goal of going after and maintaining the pressure on Daesh. We've made tremendous progress, but we want to keep that pressure on. Um, but as to the extent or the scope of the government's uh, crackdown, if you will, uh, after the coup, we're watching it closely. We've expressed our um, thoughts about it to our Turkish counterparts, and we're going to maintain that dialogue with them going forward. Yeah. yeah on, on Tuesday, Iran executed over 20 largely Kurdish prisoners, calling them terrorists and saying and claiming they were Islamic extremists. So two questions. Do you have any comment on those executions generally? And given that the Iranian Kurds are predominantly secular, and Kurds tend to be secular generally because national identity trumps religious identity, might Iran be mischaracterizing those whom it executed to confuse people inside and outside the country? So I, I would just say we reaffirm our uh, calls uh, for Iran to respect and protect human rights and to ensure fair and transparent judicial uh, proceedings in all cases. Uh, this is something we've consistently uh, expressed. Uh, uh, our concerns about uh, Iran's human rights record uh, have been expressed in a range of channels, uh, obviously in our annual human rights report, but also in our, in our international uh, religious freedom uh, report. Um, and we've also worked with other countries uh, within the UN framework, uh, General Assembly, as well as UN Ra Human Rights Council to highlight our human rights concerns in Iran. So, so without trying to address the specifics of this case, which we frankly don't know much about, uh, I would just say that, you know, what we would expect and call on Iran to do is to ensure that any uh, legal uh, process is uh, fair uh, and transparent. Iran has, excuse me, Iran has the highest number of executions per capita of any country in the entire world. If the Iranians aren't heeding your, you know, paying attention to these reports and your suggestions, are there further steps that you'd be contemplating? Uh, well, again, I mean, these are all actions or all uh, rather uh, concerns that we would address appropriately in the right fora. Uh, one of those, as I noted, was the UN Human Rights Council. Um, you know, we one of the most effective things that we can do uh, is shine a light on uh, some of these uh, actions, and we do so through our human rights report, which is widely read and widely regarded as, uh, you know, one of the best, uh, most thoroughly uh, researched uh, publications about human rights, the state of human rights uh, around the globe. So, you know, these are all uh, efforts that we continually make to, as I said, shine a light on uh, where we view uh, excessive human rights abuses. Go back on Iran, I have to yes, sir. They're very brief. Back to the settlement question. Yeah, sure thing. Do you know why the settlement was not reached on the 16th, the same day that the nuclear deal was implemented? What was it that held it up until the, the announcement until the 17th, which, as you recall, is the day that the prisoners were released? Do you know? I don't know. And then yesterday, I believe you agreed to take the question from my colleague, James Rosen, about the timing of the plane uh, carrying the, I won't say cash, but I'll say just carrying the method of payment sure. for the 400 million. Did it land in Tehran before or after the plane carrying the uh, prisoners left Tehran for Geneva? Uh, and I don't believe we've gotten clarity on that as well, either. 
in terms of the timing. I don't have it. Can you take the question again? Well, we the question Did, is. You know, is the it, question it, is still taken? I mean, if we haven't it, gotten an answer. Okay. Well, do you know? Was there an effort made to find out? Yes. Okay. And the and the answer came back. No, we're not going to tell you. Or the answer was we don't know. Um, we're still looking into it. We're still looking into and it. So it's an active question. Still. Sure. Okay. Can I move quickly? Israeli issue. Yeah. Very quickly. Of course. Uh, last week, uh, an Israeli soldier in the occupied city of Hebron roughed up a little Palestinian girl on a bicycle, and then he took her bike and destroyed her. My question to you is very simple. Should Israel compensate this little girl for the bicycle? <laughs> Great. <Grace. coughs> so I don't know that that's a question we necessarily should answer from the podium of the State Department. But what I'll say is, you know, we understand the tensions that exist in Israel regarding security and security concerns. Um, but, and I've seen the video. I know what you're talking about. It's also legitimate to say that uh, what's portrayed in that video is concerning and raises emotions on the part of uh, many people who see it. Uh, and then any security forces, and I'm talking about not just Israel's, but any security forces around the world have a difficult job. We understand that. They have to balance a lot of factors in carrying out their duties. But they also need to be aware of how their actions uh, portray uh, what they're doing and, and the reasons behind what they're doing uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, so. That's a question for the Israeli authorities to speak to. Uh, I'm just offering uh, my opinion. But you subsidize Israel to the tune of billions of dollars. We do. Should you should you deduct like a hundred dollars <laughs> to pay for that bicycle? That's a serious question. No, I... Should you deduct a hundred dollars <laughs> from the forty billion dollars or so that you're about to give Israel for the next ten years and say this is, uh, you know, to replace the bicycle? Say, uh, so. I, I spoke about this a little bit yesterday. Our security uh, um, relationship with uh, Israel is important both to Israel's national security interests as well as our own, as well as the region's. And it's vital uh, that we maintain that close cooperation. And frankly, uh, uh, that, that relationship, as I said yesterday, is ironclad. Um, you know, Israel is a strong democracy in the region and a strong proponent of democratic values in the region. We're looking at this incident. I agree that, again, for those who watch the video, you know, I can see where it raises emotions and raises concerns. And what we've always said, and that bears, uh, that, uh, that is true for Israel security forces or Israelis, as well as for Palestinians, is that all sides need to bear in mind and take uh, or make efforts uh, not to escalate tensions and and be uh, aware that their actions uh, could escalate tensions in what is already an overly tense situation. And I think that's our message. So you don't, you will, you will not urge Israel to compensate this little I'm not aware of any effort to win a part. $100 for to, I'm not to pay for the we, bicycle. And I'm not, I'm not even sure we could do that. Please. Uh, South Asia. Of course. Uh, Wait, where are we? Two questions. Thanks, yeah, sure. sir. Uh, Mark, uh, uh, Sark is meeting in Islamabad, and home ministers from the Sark nations met there, and including Raj, Mr. Rajnath, home minister of India. What he emphasized was mainly on terrorism, and uh, bef even before his arrival, there were demonstrations by the terrorists wanted by the U.S. and India in Islamabad uh, for blocking him not to re come to Islamabad. Um, those terrorists are openly calling on the death to U.S. and death to India, and uh, uh, they don't care because nobody is arresting them or going after them. My question is here. You're talking about in Islamabad. This in is Islamabad. Where this meeting took place. Right, Karachi, Islamabad, and Lahore, and all that. Um, uh, Home Minister of India, Mr. Rajnath, said that uh, I am here on the invitation of uh, the uh, government of uh, Pakistan, and we wanted to make sure that we fight together against these terrorists who are killing innocent people, in, not only in India, but also in uh, Pakistan, among others. And uh, 
what he said that to Pakistan that don't glorify the killings of terrorists and don't make them martyrs because that will they will come back to you and they are coming back to you anyway. So we should uh, unite all of us uh, against them. But somehow he said Pakistan is not listening because at least three terrorists are wanted by India. Of course, the names are Daud Ibrahim and Afi Said and uh, Lakhvi, among others, uh, which uh, he said we have given the proofs to the Pakistanis, and, but they not listening. So what he is saying, where do we go from here? And what you have anything about this? Uh, I, I mean, I, first of all, um, you know, Goyle, you've heard us say it many times. I mean, we encourage uh, uh, that kind of regional dialogue regarding counterterrorism efforts. Uh, we advocate for closer cooperation, certainly between India and Pakistan, to deal with terrorist threats in both their countries. Um, you know, terrorism is uh, obviously uh, a reality uh, in both countries, and they need to, uh, to affect, in order to effectively confront it, uh, they need to work together, uh, and that's something we've long encouraged. Uh, so it's important that they have these fora, these forum, uh, this forum rather, uh, to talk about in a candid way uh, some of the uh, areas of disagreement uh, and some of the areas of concern between the two of them. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the back and forth, except to say that you know we obviously uh, believe that Pakistan needs to do all it can to confront all terrorists operating on its soil. Uh, we've seen it make progress. Uh, we want to see more progress on its part. Second, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. I, I just I, I have to leave in five minutes. Uh, on the, you're familiar with you the Jordan. You stand up here yesterday. I'm not. Okay, I might just make you just <laughs> You're sorry. familiar with the situation of the Syrian refugees in the Jordan Berm. Yes. There was so there was a, a, a delivery of aid by crane today by the UN, um, which I assume you think is, is is good news, welcome news. But I'm just wondering if do you. Um, are you, is this satisfactory? Uh, are you pressing the Jordanians to allow more in? So, um, as unorthodox a method as it was, uh, we are very happy that the UN was able to deliver food and other urgently needed assistance to, uh, for the first time, I believe, since June 21st, uh, to uh, uh, these Syrian refugees or these Syrians, uh, displaced Syrians, uh, who are on the other side of the border. Um, you know, and if the UN and the Jordanian government agree to a, that a crane is the most efficient or effective way or appropriate way to do that, then we're not going to second guess that decision. Uh, the point is that the food and the other assistance got to the people who desperately need it. Um, is it enough? No. Um, we need uh, everyone to do more, and we certainly recognize that Jordan has done a tremendous amount, and we appreciate the generosity of Jordan uh, in and the Jordanian people, for that matter, in hosting hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees and stand together with them and are going to continue to work with the international community uh, to identify uh, ways that we can assist uh, those vulnerable Syrian uh, who are uh, stranded on the Jordan-Syria border. Um, you know, and it also speaks, frankly, to the broader issue that uh, we haven't gotten full humanitarian access. The UN has not gotten full humanitarian access to all the areas within Syria, and that's another thing we need to continue to pursue. All right. So second, yep. you're probably aware that a lawyer, the third this week in China, has been convicted uh, of uh, subversion. Yep. Do you have anything to say about today's case, but then more generally the trend that appears to be um, – Emerging. So we're obviously watching the trials. These human rights activists and lawyers who were detained on and around uh, July 9th uh, this, in 2015 uh, were concerned that uh, several have been sentenced to prison terms of up to seven years based on uh, what we consider vague and apparently politically motivated charges, uh, such as, uh, quote, subversion of state power, end quote. Uh, it's troubling. Uh, that Chinese authorities deny these defendants access to their chosen counsel and family members as well. Uh, and we urge China to release all of the lawyers and activists who were detained on July 9th, 2015, uh, and remove restrictions on their freedom of movement and professional activities. Thank you. Yep. On the chemical attacks or the allegations of chemical attacks by Russia or yep. the opposite uh, 
so uh, and we also had that obviously so we've had two separate allegations made over the past several days um, uh, we're looking into both of them uh, as we would any credible allegation of a chemical attack we as we stated clearly yesterday we condemn the use of any chemical weapons um, uh, Russia did share uh, I was unaware of it when I briefed yesterday but did share uh, the allegations of the second uh, chemical weapons attack uh, but uh, up till now we've not seen conclusive evidence uh, to suggest that such an attack took place uh, but of course we're very concerned about uh, and are looking into the allegations uh, these allegations as well as the allegations of chlorine gas that was used by the regime in the town of Sarakib um, uh, we would call on the OPCW as well as the UN to, to use existing mechanisms to investigate these allegations thoroughly uh, and uh, you know use by any party in Syria uh, of chemical weapons would violate international standards and norms against such use uh, and we call on all parties uh, to abide by uh, all commitments made under the cessation of hostilities and that includes a moratorium on targeting civilians uh, or civilian facilities Of course. Um, the newly appointed Japanese Defense Minister, Tomomi Nada, earlier today declined to say whether Japan liberated or invaded Asian countries in World War II. Uh, is there any question here at the State Department on whether Japan invaded or liberated Asian countries? Uh, look, I'm not going to, you know, relitigate uh, what is historical record. I'll leave it there. Do you think it's constructive for a defense minister to raise such questions, given the potential to exacerbate regional tensions? Um, look, I'm not going to uh, parse or second guess uh, those comments. Uh, you know, Japan's a democracy. Uh, there's freedom of speech there. Uh, again, I'm just not going to relitigate the uh, historical record. Please, in the back, sir. I have a couple of questions on Guantanamo. Um, uh, former Guantanamo detainee, um, you had the, uh, um, who, who was sent to Uruguay in uh, 2014, went missing a while ago, and as I understand, he's still missing. Um, what is the, uh, what does the Department of State know about this case as of today? Uh, I'm aware of the case, and I'm actually looking. I, I thought we had an update on that. Um, if we do, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get it to you afterwards. I, I just don't have it in front of me. I apologize. Okay. I'm, um, let me ask you another question of about course. this case, if you have this information. Of course. Um, is this person uh, considered a threat to the U.S.? This person who went missing? Yes. Um, again, and I don't want to speak out of, I, I was aware that one of these individuals who went missing actually turned up. That's why I'm looking so <laughs> befuddled because I thought that one of them actually had uh, turned up. But let me double check that. I mean, of course, um, you know, a couple of points to make. One is, uh, whenever we, uh, uh, whenever we decide anyone from uh, Guantanamo is eligible for relocation or resettlement, uh, that is only done after a very lengthy uh, process, where it's determined that this person, to the best of our knowledge and, and best of our belief. Uh, uh, no longer constitutes or uh, a risk or a threat, not just to the United States, but to anyone. Um, and that's the first, very first step before we even negotiate or begin to talk to other governments about resettling these individuals. Uh, as part of the resettlement uh, dialogue that we have with other governments, uh, we talk about ways to, uh, in fact, uh, ensure that uh, these kinds of incidents can't take place uh, where uh, um, resettled uh, Guantanamo inmates simply disappear or fall off the grid uh, for whatever reason. Uh, it, it has happened. Uh, and there are even cases, as we all know here, where some of these uh, individuals have even shown back up in the, the battlefield. The cases of those kinds of cases, rather, the percentage is very low very low. Uh, we'd like it to be zero. Um, but, you know, in any process like this, we can never be 100 uh, percent correct all the time. But we take it very seriously. Um, and so as to whether we're concerned, of course, we're always concerned when 
uh, any one of these individuals, as I said, falls off the grid, falls off the radar, disappears, uh, and we make every effort to work with both uh, national authorities in these countries as well as regional authorities to locate them. Can I have a, uh, I don't know if you have the uh, figures, but uh, the latest update on the number of detainees? Yeah, I apologize. I, I will, um, I, I may. Uh, <laughs> as you can see, this book is a little uh, uh, chock full of information here. Um, but we'll get those for you after the briefing. Thank you. Please. Can I clarify your of course. answer on the gas attack? Um, yeah, sure. When you said there was no conclusive evidence, are you talking about which which gas Both. attack? Both. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, you know, so just to talk about the process, um, I mean, these are, these kinds of attacks are always investigated through the OPCW. Yeah. And, you know, they're not, we're not able to reach, or they're not able to reach a conclusion overnight or even in a couple of days, but they are looking at the facts and the allegations and are investigating it appropriately. So you're talking about the one that was both. reported last week and then Yeah, I mean, we're calling on it. We want to see both investigated. There was, yeah, there were two incidents. One okay. on, uh, 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 um, that's believed to be, alleged to be the regime of chlorine gas, and then this other one was reported yesterday. And then, um, um, the, and the, the Russians, the, the Russians had, did uh, notify you of they did. Okay, and then um, can I just of follow the up second attack of the second attack? Can I just follow up on the other one uh, on another issue related? Is how do you square um, these this, these ongoing attacks and the tensions um, in Syria with what with how the um, with ongoing or with discussions um, with the Russians on military cooperation? Can you con can you have normal discussions? as well as um, while these kinds of attacks are going on? Uh, so you're, you're correct that it, it, it does uh, make that dynamic uh, difficult. Um, you know, the, the fact that the Russians uh, supported the regime in its uh, attempt to uh, seal off and retake Aleppo, uh, unbeknownst to us, um, uh, has not made those efforts to uh, work together on finding a way forward any easier. And in fact, uh, you know, as the Secretary alluded to after his uh, meeting with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov in Vientiane uh, last week, you know, we believe that the discussions we've had with the Russians in Geneva uh, have made progress. The goal of those discussions, as we've uh, talked about, is how to make sense of uh, what groups are located where uh, in and around Aleppo, but certainly beyond Aleppo, in and around uh, Syria, so that we can focus efforts where we believe they need to be focused, which is on going after Nusra and going after Daesh, and then uh, only then can we put a moderate, uh, or can we put in place a, 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 a cessation of hostilities uh, that is credible and that will allow uh, talks to get going on again in Geneva. That's where we're at. It's not an easy place to be, um, and certainly not made any easier by uh, these latest this uh, assault on uh, Aleppo, uh, and. You know, but that doesn't mean we're we don't still believe that the effort is worthwhile. So you are still it. talking. We are still talking. And uh, can I do one, one more follow up? He uh, Kerry said that he was going. He wanted to have a. Uh, he said in Laos, in fact, where you were, um, that he want that he would be able to announce any, uh, or he hoped to announce a an agreement on this early August. Given these new tensions and attacks, um, is that still possible? Uh, we're not there yet. Yeah. I'm you very quickly. I know there's uh, something probably come out tomorrow on the status of the Syrian refugees. Do you know how many refugees have been admitted, considering that the target, the target is 10,000 and it's in October? I so. do. I can say by, as of August 4th, there have been nearly 8,000. The exact okay. figure is 7,905 uh, Syrian uh, refugees have been admitted. That's as of August 4th. So by, by all accounts, you'll be able to meet the target of 10,000 by the end of the fiscal year. I just would, yes. 
We knock on it. I knock on it. I just want to finish my counterterrorism question. Have a quickly. The transcript, sorry. Uh, quickly. Thank you, sir. Uh, one, um, is the U.S. satisfied with Pakistan as far as fighting against terrorism? And second, uh, as far as uh, uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is concerned, he is very serious fighting against terrorism and running the, his government peacefully. But his hands are tied by the military because he doesn't want to make the same mistake which, which he did in 1993 when his government was overthrown by the military. So many experts in Pakistan and here think that their parallel governments are going on there uh, mil by the military and by the civilians. So where the U.S. is uh, now, uh, is anybody has been c connected uh, or contacted from Islamabad here, uh, what's going on in Pakistan, or how do you feel, or U.S. is taking this uh, two powers or two governments within Pakistan? Um, that's a very detailed question. Um, how I would answer it is, you know, we believe that Pakistan has taken and is taking steps to counter terrorist violence. Uh, and certainly focusing on those groups that we that threaten Pakistani or Pakistan stability. Um, they have, the military has shut down some of these safe havens. Um, they have restored government control to parts of Pakistan uh, that were used as terrorist safe havens for years. Uh, and these are important steps that have continued or contributed rather to uh, security interests in the region. Uh, and they've come at a cost uh, of Pakistani lives lost. Um, but at the same time, we've been very clear uh, with the highest levels of the government of Pakistan that they must target all militant groups. And that includes those that target Pakistan's neighbors. And they must also close all safe havens. So I guess to put it briefly or summarize it, you know, they've made progress. They're going after groups. But selectively, we need to see them go after all groups. And as I just said, even those groups that might not threaten Pakistan itself, but threaten its neighbors. Of course. Of course. Thank you. Um, so before that, uh, one question just comes in, in my mind. Uh, so you were just talking about the uh, about the uh, incident happened in Israel. So you just said that you are uh, very concerned, the United States is very concerned about the uh, security of uh, Israelis. So what about the security of Palestinians? I mean, is it the, uh, do you give the same importance to the security of the Palestinians as the Israelis? You're talking about Palestinians? Yes. Uh, I mean, of course, what we want to see, and, you know, our consistent messaging is, or our consistent message, rather, uh, is that, you know, we want to see all sides uh, in Israel and in Pakistan, or, I'm sorry, excuse me, in, I was just talking about that. And sorry, I apologize. And in, uh, among the Palestinian people, uh, exercise restraint and take measures that don't escalate tensions that are already there. Obviously, the security situation there uh, is very tense. Uh, all I was trying to convey in my response uh, to Saeed's question was that uh, there have been a series or a number of uh, terrorist attacks on innocent Israelis. And that has generated a high level of concern, rightly so, among Israel's security forces, a heightened sense, if you will. Uh, and that's understandable. But as they carry out, and again, I, I'm not just noting this for Israel, but in any place around the world, uh, that any security forces need to exercise a certain amount of restraint. It's part of the job. It's part of their duties. Sir, you, you just said that Pakistan doing, uh, has uh, progressed in the military operations against the terrorist networks. But uh, I think you are well aware that Pentagon has withheld $300 million of military assistance to Pakistan for not acting against those militant groups who are fueling violence in Afghanistan. So do you have anything to say on that? Uh, not much. I mean, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense uh, regarding uh, the decision uh, that they took uh, with regard to uh, fiscal year 2015 funding. Um, you know, we continue within the Department of State to uh, provide assistance uh, uh, to the Pakistani uh, people, uh, and some of that does include uh, uh, security assistance. 
um, but I don't have anything specific to add to your your question about uh, th this uh, reduction in funding. Sir, but you, are you agreed with the Pentagon that Pakistan is not doing enough to eliminate Haqqani networks and other uh, militant groups who are uh, fueling violence in Afghanistan? Are you agreed with the Pentagon? Well, again, I think, you know, uh, I, I, and I think I just addressed this in uh, talking to, responding to Goyle's question. You know, we have concern about terrorist safe havens inside Pakistan's borders. We've urged the government of Pakistan to address this um, and to uh, pursue closer counterterrorism cooperation with Afghanistan against all groups that pose a long term security threat to the region, not just to Pakistan. The situation in Afghanistan is very interesting. Recently, a uh, visit of uh, uh, a delegation of uh, Afghan Taliban recently visited China. I mean, they are not talking to the U.S., uh, they are not talking to Pakistan, they are not willing to talk to the political setup of Afghanistan, but they are visiting China. I mean, what China can help in uh, uh, getting the peace in you know, Afghanistan? I'd refer you to the Chinese authorities and Chinese government to speak okay. to that. Yeah, one more. Uh, the one on China. Uh, yesterday, China uh, formed a quadrilateral counterterrorism alliance in, in association with Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Tajikistan. Uh, do you think this is a helpful move from Chinese? I'm sorry, you're, are you talking about the same? You're not talking about the Taliban group, but you're um, talking about a separate different. thing. I apologize. This Could you give me the question one more time? This was a meeting of the you know, military leaders of four countries at the initiative of China. Uh, other countries, Afghanistan, pa Pakistan, and Tajikistan, they have formed a quadrilateral counterterrorism alliance. How helpful is this in your fight against terrorism? I mean, well, my answer is that we don't, uh, you know, uh, we don't view it as in any way counterproductive, and we don't view it as a zero zero sum game that China pursues closer ties, certainly in the security field, and certainly in the counterterrorism field, uh, with. Uh, 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 Central Asian countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of problems to be addressed. Uh, so we certainly uh, don't view any uh, effort uh, to more closely coordinate among those countries, all of whom are affected by uh, terrorism in the region. Uh, uh, we don't view that as a negative at all. In fact, uh, we view it as a positive. So you view this as a helpful move? I said I view it as a positive. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah.